finally had a home of my own and a life full of purpose, the whole country began to unravel. It began with that dreadful incident at Harper's Ferry with John Brown. The governor ordered troops and VMI cadets to guard at the hanging. My husband and Major Jackson accompanied them. When South Carolina and others seceded after Lincoln's election, students from the seceding states began stirring up sympathy for the Confederate cause and wearing blue rosettes in their buttonholes. My husband was strong for the Union and denounced the hot haste of South Carolina in seceding. The debates in the local Franklin Society became more passionate. How sincerely and with what boldness was the old Union defended in those halls, but also how ably and with what passionate devotion was states' rights advocated there. In one thing, they were ever agreed, Virginia. Virginia was their mother. For her, under all circumstances, they were willing to die. But my father had no such loyalty to Virginia. He could not accept disunion under any circumstances. He would storm up and down my large chamber, fiercely denouncing Mr. Preston's quiet statement that his allegiance was due first to Virginia. And what could I say? I had always championed the causes of my father. But how could I forsake my husband? When Virginia did secede, Mr. Preston heartily agreed with her legislators that she had been forced to the act by President Lincoln's call for troops. If he had considered secession unwise, he yet held that coercion was tyranny. And while he never ceased to deplore the war, he was convinced that Virginia's part in it was the only part that consisted with honor and true loyalty. But on June 11, 1864, all our fears were realized. The enemy was upon us and was in pursuit of McCausland, who had left the town about an hour before they entered. Mr. Preston had retreated with the cadets an hour ahead of McCausland. For two hours, there was one continuous stream of cavalry riding at a fast trot and several abreast, passing out at the top of the town. Then the infantry began to pour in. These remained behind, and with the cavalry who came in after, flooded the town. They began to pour into our yard and kitchen. I ordered them out of the kitchen half a dozen at a time and hesitated not to speak in the most firm and commanding tone to them. At first, they were content with bacon, two slices apiece, but they soon became insolent, demanded the smokehouse key, and told me they would break the door unless I opened it. I protested against their pillage, and with a score of them surrounding me, with guns in their hands, proceeded to the smokehouse and threw it open, and treating them at the same time, by all the respect they had for their wives, mothers, and sisters, to leave me a little meat. They heeded me no more than wild beasts would have done, swore at me, and left me not one piece. Some rushed down the cellar steps, seized the newly churned butter there, and made off. Then, one dark winter day, I received a letter from my husband in which he said, I send you a little poem with, which is making a great stir here in Richmond. It is rather a pretty thing, but you could do something better in the same line. I accepted this as a sort of dare. I set to work with my stepdaughter Elizabeth, eagerly playing the amanuensis with rough paper, and a poor pencil by the light of a fire. I sent the manuscript to my husband in Richmond and received a letter expressing extravagant praise for my little poetical story. Colonel Preston gathered group after group of officers about him and read them Beechenbrook from beginning to end, never failing to win the tribute of tears from the sternest of them. It is the story of Douglas and Alice, or any one of thousands in the Confederacy who lost homes, or husbands, or sons. 
She feels the hot blood of the nation beat high. With rapture she catches the rallying cry. From mountain and valley and hamlet they come. On every side echoes the roll of the drum. Only a private, and who will care, when I may pass away? Or how or why I perish, or where I mix with the common clay? Morning at daybreak a terrible charge was made on the enemy's center. Such large and fresh reinforcements were held at his back, he stoutly and stubbornly met the attack. These past five years since the war have been filled with gardening, mending, covering chairs, preserving peaches, and the like. As for my writing, Beechenbrook has done so well that there have been several printings. Many who have lived through the war have admitted that they cannot read it without weeping. A new Southern magazine called Land We Love made its debut after the war with several of my poems included, and I continue to fill up its pages and a variety of others. They also frequently request my reviews of current literature. I am pleased at the generous response of my readers, who are kind enough to write, expressing their admiration for my work and the encouragement it has given them. I smile to myself many a time on receiving the letters of literary correspondents, who seem to imagine that my days are devoted to literary pursuits and that the stylus is my appropriate symbol. When, if they could look in upon me, they would find a company to breakfast, ditto to dine, ditto to tea. They would find a row of cookery books adorning my storeroom shelves. They would find me deep in the mysteries of Sally Lund, or lemon tartlets, or orange ice, or cream sponge. And so my days go by. I think that I can truly say that I have never neglected the concocting of a pudding for the sake of a poem or a sauce for a sonnet. Art is a jealous mistress, and I have only served her with my left hand because I have given my right hand to what has seemed more pressing and important. Yet God has put a song in me, and if bird and bee, if earth and sky, the lesser and the greater, fulfill their law of being, why should such as I prove traitor? So let me sing because I must to nature's order clinging, nor seek with conscious aim to thrust myself into my singing. <laughs>